go ahead and get started. Um, so tonight we're uh, very fortunate to have Dr. Sharma um, talking to us. He's um, one of our vascular medicine attendings at UVA um, with an interest in FMD, and he sees a lot of these patients. So um, this should be a great talk that we all learn a lot from. Dr. Sharma, if you want to go ahead and get started. Great. Th thanks, Manika. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to speak um, on this topic. This is certainly of great interest to me. So we'll start with a case, actually a couple of cases. Uh, so this first case is of a 33-year-old female uh, with no significant past medical history, but suddenly developed severe uncontrolled hypertension. She was already on three antihypertensives, including um, a diuretic as well as ACE inhibitor. And um, you know her blood pressure wasn't well controlled at that time. Her primary care physician ended up getting a renal artery duplex on her. And interestingly, this is what we saw in the duplex that she had. Um, her renal arteries at the origin actually did not have any significant elevation in the velocities, as you can see here. The peak systolic velocity was only 53.7 centimeters. However, when we went to the distal uh, right renal artery, the velocities increased significantly and were up to more than 200 centimeters per second, which is uh, concerning for significant stenosis. We proceeded with getting an angiogram, and here you can see that there is a stenosis noted over in the upper branch of the right renal artery, uh, just significant narrowing, which is consistent with the fibromuscular dysplasia. Uh, so the next case I'll talk to you about is actually a 65-year-old lady whose past medical history was significant for hypertension and just osteoarthritis. And she just came over for a regular physical examination. She had a new primary care doctor who ended up listening to her carotid arteries um, auscultating it and found out that she had bilateral carotid brui. Uh, this led to her getting a carotid duplex. Um, the duplex in the right proximal lintel carotid artery showed no significant elevation in velocities. However, when you went up to the mid, peak systolic velocities was up to 166 centimeters per second, which is which is quite quite high. And distally also it was elevated at 144 centimeters per second. Um, in this lady, then she was referred to vascular medicine. We ended up getting a CTA of her neck. And as you can see here in the right internal carotid artery, not at the bulb or the proximal ICA, but in the mid and the distal section of the internal carotid artery, you can see this sort of irregular beaded like appearance on the right as well as on the left side. And this is um, fibromuscular dysplasia. So, goal for this hour would be to uh, go through certain things, the definition, epidemiology of fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD uh, classification, that is histology as well as angiographic classification, looking at etiology, clinical manifestations, a diagnostic approach, treatment strategies, uh, what mimics FMD, um, and then talk about certain other things such as the Fibromuscular Dysplasia Society of America, the Fibromuscular Dysplasia Registry, um, the new association of spontaneous coronary dissections and fibromuscular dysplasia, and finally some clinical polls. So, so what is FMD? Now, FMD is truly a non-atherosclerotic, non-inflammatory arterial disease. You can find this in any vascular bed, but it typically is noticed in the carotids, renal arteries, and the external iliac arteries. This is frequently associated with stenosis, aneurysms, dissections, or sometimes even complete occlusion of the artery. This was first seen at John Hopkins Medical Center uh, when a child presented with severe uncontrolled hypertension, um, and he was noted to have severe unilateral renal artery stenosis. He actually underwent open repair at that time. It wasn't until, however, till 1971 that finally fibromuscular dysplasia was classified pathologically. Now, when we look at classifications, we look at the old form, which was the histological classification, in which case FMD is divided into three types, medial dysplasia, intimal dysplasia, and then adventitial or periarterial fibroplasia. The medial dysplasia accounts for the far majority of cases that we'll encounter in clinical practice. In fact, 75% of the cases are medial uh, Medial, uh, in fact, actually 75% of the cases are a form of medial dysplasia, that's medial fibroplasia. In this type of um, FMD, what we see is the media 
um, the vessel, the media layer of the vessel has very thin and thick areas without any inflammatory changes. The thick areas contain excess collagen, and the thin areas contain very small amounts of collagen. Um, in fact, the thin areas can become aneurysmal, causing uh, aneurysms in the future. Um, the perimedial fibroplasia accounts for about 5 to 10 percent of the cases. Now, this is another form of medial dysplasia that is seen. And in this case, excessive collagen deposition is noted in the outer half of the media in certain areas, and this typically causes severe stenosis. Medial hyperplasia is another form. In this case, basically what we see is smooth muscle cell hyperplasia without any fibrosis. The intimal dysplasia type is a fairly rare form of FMD and it accounts for less than 10% of all the cases. In this particular type, the intima is affected and it's very thick with circumferential or eccentric collagen deposition. The adventitial or periarterial fibroplasia is extremely rare and accounts for only 1% or fewer than that cases of FMD. And this typically, in this form, the adventitia is affected where the collagen replaces the fibrous tissue. Histology nowadays is not frequently found since far majority of these patients don't require any surgical interventions and hence we don't get any tissue on them. More frequently nowadays, FMD is diagnosed angiographically, that is via CTA, MRA, or conventional angiography. And when we look at it angiographically, you define these as three different forms. The most common form is the multifocal or string of beads FMD. Over here, as you can see, you see multiple different small beads which are irregular in appearance on this particular vessel. Histology-wise, this typically tends to be the medial type. Focal FMD is what you can see over here in this particular renal artery where this, this one segment of narrowing, and this is typically intimal or medial. And then the tubular FMD is very similar to the focal FMD except that it is more prolonged um, narrowing, and uh, this can be of any type, intimal, medial, or adventitial. There have been some studies that have looked at comparing histology and angiographic imaging, and interestingly, what we've seen is that the string of beads appearance, the multifocal type, has been seen mostly in the medial form of FMD when looked at histolo histology. The focal can be divided between intimal and medial, and tubular form can be either. What causes FMD? This is unfortunately still a mystery. We, we still don't know what truly causes FMD. There are some hypotheses though. And some of these hypotheses are uh, related to the fact that this is seen more in women than in men. In fact, the ratio is nine is to one. And so we suspect there is some hormonal cause for women to have more likely to have this disease. A larger number of patients with fibromuscular dysplasia tend to smoke, and so we suspect there is some association. However, stating that, we do know that there are a large number of patients who have FMD and do not smoke. Finally, there was this hypothesis of renal mobility leading to FMD that was generated a few years ago. However, this was never um, confirmed in future studies. We also suspect that there is some kind of genetic association in this particular disorder as up to 11% of patients have reported family members with fibromuscular dysplasia. And this is just self-reporting and, and not even confirmed uh, by physicians by checking multiple family members. A study of 20 families had been done in the past which re revealed that autosomal dominant inheritance pattern was noted in about 60% of cases. And finally, we also suspect there might be some genetic association as FMD has been associated with certain other disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Alport syndrome, or coactation and aneurysms of the aorta. When you look at clinical manifestation, depending upon the location of fibromuscular dysplasia, you may find different clinical manifestations. When it's renal fibromuscular dysplasia, Typically, we see these patients as having hypertension, abdominal bruit, dissections, aneurysms, and sometimes it can be found incidentally just on imaging. Carotid fibromuscular dysplasia is frequently associated with bruits, 
It can again be found incidentally on imaging, carotid dissection, headaches, TIA or stroke, and frequently these patients will complain of swishing sound in their ears or pulsatile tinnitus. When other vessels are involved, you'll see mesenteric ang angina with weight loss, arm or leg claudication, femoral bruise, embolic events, especially if the upper or lower extremities um, are involved. You'll see blue toes or blue fingers. And finally, spontaneous coronary artery dissection can be also seen in patients with fibromuscular dysplasia. We don't really know what the true prevalence of fibromuscular dysplasia is. However, there are certain studies that have looked into this, and what we have found is that when we look at kidney donor studies, asymptomatic renal fibromuscular dysplasia was seen in up to 38 to 4.4% of patients. In fact, the CORAL trial, which was just released today in the American Heart Association, uh, mind you, CORAL trial is a study that was looking at renovascular hypertension for renal artery stenosis, and FMD was an exclusion criteria for the study, However, still 5.6% of the patients in this particular study had fibromuscular dysplasia. And hence, we do suspect that this may not be as rare of a disease that so far has been thought to. When you look at vascular bed involvement, recently we have had some registry studies that I'll talk more about a little bit more in detail. However, prior to that, we only had one study back in 1982 which looked at uh, vascular bed involvement in FMP. And in that study particularly reported that a large number of patients typically tend to have renal FMD. And in this particular study of close to 1,200 patients, 58% of patients had FMD in their renal arteries, about 32% had FMD in their carotid arteries. Looking at diagnostic modalities, in the past, FMD was diagnosed frequently on conventional angiography. However, with better technologies, now we use ultrasound, CTAs, and MRAs to look for diagnosing FMD. Now, um, duplex ultrasound is frequently used, at least as an initial test, to look for fibromuscular dysplasia or whenever we are trying to image any specific blood vessels. What you'll usually see in duplex ultrasound is that there is increased peak systolic velocities in the mid and distal renal and carotid arteries. This is very typical for fibromuscular dysplasia. And if color power Doppler is used, you'll notice beating appearance in these vessels. And this is one example where color power Doppler is being used in the ultrasound. And over here, you can notice how you can see irregular beats all across this vessel. This is the case of a 46-year-old lady who was suffering from headaches, and over here you can see how the ICA appears like a string of beats. And when we check for color power, when we check for velocities, we notice that her peak systolic velocity was as high as 200 centimeters per second. So how accurate is duplex ultrasonography in the diagnosis of carotid and renal fibromuscular dysplasia. Not until recently, we had this study that looked into this in great detail, and they compared duplex ultrasonography to angiography. And what they found out that was that ultrasound had a fairly decent positive predictive value in identifying fibromuscular dysplasia. However, the negative predictive value was not so great. As you can see here, the negative predictive value for carotid arteries was about 62.2%, and for renal arteries was 62.3%. Now, this further dropped when we are trying to look for aneurysm, pseudoaneurysms, or dissections, where it was down to 30.4% with carotid arteries and 9.1% with renal arteries. So I believe that a duplex ultrasonography certainly is a good tool, but has certain limitations. It is not as accurate as CT or MR or even conventional angiography. So if you have a high suspicion for fibromuscular dysplasia in a patient and the duplex ultrasonography comes back as normal, I will still proceed with using other forms of imaging to confirm your diagnosis or rule out your diagnosis. Duplex ultrasonography is more likely to identify FMD 
if it is more severely stenotic or symptomatic. And yes, it is less likely to identify FMD, especially if it is asymptomatic or very mild. Again, it's not a good tool when you're looking for aneurysms or dissections. Finally, it certainly might be something that's worthwhile to use, especially in patients who you have confirmed to have fibromuscular dysplasia, and you're just using an imaging technique to continue to follow them longitudinally. Diagnosis of, um, we can also use a CTA or MRA for diagnosis, um, and this is nowadays more commonly used for confirmatory diagnosis. Um, rarely are we using conventional angiography anymore for uh, diagnostic confirmation and are actually limiting those only when patients need any form of endovascular intervention. And these are two images of uh, very interesting patients of mine here. You can see um, this patient has a string of beads appearance in her distal internal carotid arteries bilaterally. Now, in, addition, in this particular case, you can see their FMD in the um, iliacs as well as um, the renal arteries. CT and MRA both have very good accuracy. And when we start looking at it more clinically, I think CTA provides better imaging, especially when you're looking for finer vessels or very mild FMD-like changes, and perhaps MRI might be better when you're trying to differentiate FMD from other forms of vascular disorders, such as vasculitis. There are certain disorders that can certainly mimic fibromuscular dysplasia. These consist of vascular connective tissue diseases, such as vascular airless danlos syndrome, which is the type 4 airless danlos syndrome, Lewitz D syndrome, Marfan syndrome, um, idiopathic carotid dissections, SAM or segmental arterial medialysis, irregular run of the mill atherosclerosis, and vasculitis. The most common thing that you will look at is to differentiate fibromuscular dysplasia from atherosclerosis. And they have certain very classic distinct features that can help you differentiate them angiographically. Over here, you can see this patient has uh, fibromuscular dysplasia of the renal artery. Clearly, you can see that the ostium and the proximal renal artery is spared, and you notice the beating more in the mid and the distal segments of the renal artery. With atherosclerosis, typically, narrowing will be noted at the ostium and the proximal renal artery. And of course, you'll see significant atherosclerosis in patients with uh, renal artery stenosis. This is another image looking at the carotid arteries. And over here, you can notice this patient who has fibromuscular dysplasia. She actually has some calcification in the proximal region too. However, fibromuscular dysplasia is seen more in the mid and the distal internal carotid artery and this is another patient who has severe stenosis of her internal carotid artery. And in this particular case, you can see how there's calcification and severe narrowing in the proximal artery, right close to the bifurcation and the bulb. Another mimic uh, for uh, fibromuscular dysplasia is standing waves. Standing waves is actually a physiological phenomenon which is completely benign and hence it's very important to differentiate this from fibromuscular dysplasia. And this is a case of a patient who had actually come, to, come over to see us all the way from California. Um, and this is when I was actually a fellow at, um, at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and so this, um, this lady came in uh, wondering if she had uh, FMD in, and she had an angiogram done at an outside hospital in California where she, they did an angiogram here, had diagnosed her with FMD in her SFA as well as her pedal vessels. Um, and the first thing that sort of stands out is, you know, SFA is not, SFA is, typically does not have fibromuscular dysplasia. That's not a common location to have it. And here you can notice that the beating is very regular. However, beating with FMD typically tends to be irregular, as in this particular case, you can see how it is, it's irregular. Um, and this beating went all the way down to her pedal vessels. And so this, this was standing waves, which is a normal physiological phenomenon when you inject contrast quickly into vessels. Finally, fibromuscular dysplasia to be compared from vasculitis. And typically with vasculitis, and this, these are two images of the same patient, 
who had uh, vasculitis of his mesenteric vessels. And over here, you can notice how there is inflammation around the celiac artery and its branches uh, right over here. There's a lot of thickening that is noticed. Now, this will typically will not be seen in patients with FMD. Another thing is that patients with vasculitis tend to have multiple constitutional symptoms. They've been sick for years and they just don't feel good. They'll complain of arthralgia and multiple vest multiple um, joints and, and so on. Um, and also these patients typically will have elevated inflammatory markers such as ESR and CRP, which won't be seen in patients with FMD. Another uh, mimic for connective t is connective tissue diseases, uh, such as ehlers danlos syndrome, Marfan's, or lewitz Dix syndrome. Typically, patients who have connective tissue diseases will have a lot of distinct clinical features, which can certainly help you differentiate that from FMD. Also, patients with uh, connective tissue diseases tend to have more aneurysms and dissections rather than having beaded appearance or single area of stenosis that is more often seen in FMD. Let's talk a bit, uh, let's talk a, a bit about now with, about cervical FMD and uh, intracranial aneurysms. So this is something that is very important when you see patients with fibromuscular dysplasia, especially those who have carotid or vertebral artery fibromuscular dysplasia. In a meta-analysis that was published many years ago, they noticed that about 24% of patients with carotid or vertebral artery fibromuscular dysplasia had intracranial aneurysms. A large number of these patients, in fact, had pre presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And up to 7% of these patients actually were asymptomatic that were then closely monitored and eventually intervened on uh, prior to a rupture, thereby saving their lives. This incidence is very high. Um, and certainly higher than patients who have atherosclerotic carotid stenosis where aneurysmal disease intracranially has been seen in about 3% of patients. And so I think um, the learning point in this particular situation is that whenever you see a patient with carotid or vertebral artery fibromuscular dysplasia, make sure to image their head for intracranial aneurysms. Genetic association with FMD. One of the major studies that was done at Cleveland Clinic uh, while I was a fellow over there was to look at uh, connective tissue disease association with FMD. And up to 200 patients with fibromuscular dysplasia uh, were evaluated uh, for connective tissue disease. And uh, there was a thorough evaluation performed where they were seen by a genetic counselor. Uh, after full physical evaluation, it was determined that about 60, 63 pa patients of this 216 patients should undergo full genetic counseling, of which 35 um, underwent genetic testing by blood testing, and only two of these patients had variants of TGF beta 1 receptor, which is in fact associated with Lewitz Dietz syndrome. Um, and hence, uh, there is some association or concomitantly, you will see patients who have vascular connective tissue diseases and FMD, but it is likely that these are two distinct entities occurring in the same patient uh, by chance. Let's talk a little bit about the Fibromuscular Dysplasia Society of America. Um, and so this is actually a nonprofit organization which was uh, started by um, a, a registered nurse, Pam Mays, uh, who's the executive director. Um, it's actually a very good website. Uh, it's fmdsa.org. Uh, it provides a lot of information for healthcare professionals like us, as well as a lot of information for patients too. There's actually a patient chat forum where patients can talk to each other and discuss more, which a lot of patients find very useful, especially when they are labeled with a rare disease, um, having a chance to talk to someone else who perhaps has this disease and understands what they go through um, is a, a, a great psychological benefit for them. Um, uh, the FMDSA uh, Society also has a once a year annual patient meeting uh, where multiple experts on fibromuscular dysplasia will go and talk about what's, late, what's the latest that's going on in, in this particular disorder. And finally, the FMDSA actually funds the fibromuscular dysplasia patient registry 
which has provided us with a lot of information about this particular disease um, that I'll talk in the next few minutes. So leading this talk now to the FMD patient registry. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this was started by the FMDSA, which is the Society for Fibromuscular Dysplasia. The chair for this particular registry is uh, Dr. Olin, uh, who's at Mount Sinai and the coordinating center is at, in Michigan. This initially started with only seven sites in the United States, but now we are up to 13 sites. And what we've been doing with this particular registry is that um, patients with fibromuscular dysplasia, we collect significant information on them, which consists of demographics, present tech symptoms, signs, comorbidities, family history, what diagnostic studies they have undergone, what therapeutic procedures have they undergone, and all of this is put in electronically. Then again, we keep updating their history on every six months to a yearly basis so we can have some prospective data on these patients. So, so far in this registry, we have um, enrolled up to 900 patients. Um, and uh, as you can see, these are the multiple sites that have been actively enrolling uh, patients um, with the you know, highest enrollment coming through Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, Greenville Hospital System in South Carolina, University of Michigan, and University of Virginia. I've learned a lot of things from this registry. The first paper that was published by this registry was in uh, 2012, and it certainly was an eye-opener. What we saw is that the average age of the patient who was enrolled in this registry was 51 years. Um, this really broke the norms that we understood about fibromuscular dysplasia. Fibromuscular dysplasia classically is taught in medical school as being the disease of a young lady, which is, you know, ladies and uh, women in their 20s or 30s. However, in this registry, what we identified is that typically a patient is diagnosed with fibromuscular dysplasia in their late 40s or early 50s. Um, another distressing fact was, of, was that patients typically develop symptoms of FMD when they are in their late 40s on an average, or in this study was 47 years. However, they are diagnosed with FMD almost four years after suffering from these symptoms, which is truly unfortunate that it takes such a while before the patients get diagnosed with this disorder. Um, as expected, the, uh, this registry did show that up to 91% of the patients in this, uh, in this registry were women. Um, with regards to race, what was seen is that 95% of patients were white, with other races um, noted to be in less than 5% of the, of the patients enrolled in the registry. 65% of these patients were postmenopausal, and up to 70% of these patients had received hormone therapy at, some, at any time of their life. And this could be oral contraceptive pills, or could be hormone replacement therapy. And up to 34% of these patients have smoked in the past or are current smokers. When we looked at the family history, this was very interesting to us. Almost 20% of patients have family history of aneurysmal disease. Up to 19.8% of patients have family history of sudden death and 7.3% of patients self-reported family history of fibromuscular dysplasia. This is certainly very high. When we started looking at presenting symptoms and signs for fibromuscular dysplasia, 66% of patients had hypertension, 56.8% of patients complained of headaches, 33.4% complained of pulsatile tinnitus, dizziness, cervical bruit, and neck pain were the other few complaints that was frequently seen. There were multiple other presenting signs and symptoms um, which, based on the location of the disease, were also seen in these patients. However, what stood out also was the fact that 5.6% of patients in this particular registry had no presenting signs or symptoms. In fact, they were diagnosed incidentally as having fibromuscular dysplasia. The most common symptoms we frequently see with these patients is hypertension and headaches, and often this happens together in multiple patients. 
Uh, when we look more in detail, what we found out is that the age of onset for typically for these patients to have hypertension was in their mid-40s. The average age was 43.4, um, which in fact would be the age when somebody is likely to be diagnosed with essential hypertension too. Um, and the median number of antihypertensive these patients were was about two. Headache also a, a frequent symptom was often defined as being a migraine type headache. And a large number of these patients actually were on in some form of suppressive therapy for their headaches, which indicates that this certainly was something that was severe and was debilitating for them. When we look at what diagnostic testing had been used in the registry to look for FMD, the far majority of patients, uh, especially when you look at the carotids and multiple arteries, a uh, far majority of the patients had duplex uh, ultrasonography that was used, and then CT, MR, or angiography was equally divided. Uh, when we look at um, renal or mesenteric or abdominal imaging, duplex again was the highest, and then angio CT or MRA was equally divided. Again, far majority of the patients in this study would get a duplex and then get a confirmatory test, which was either MR, CT, or angiography. Now, trying to look at the breakdown of the types of FMD identified in these patients, uh, I, should, I should let you know that far majority of these patients in the registry were identified for the type of FMD based on angiographic images, and then assumption was made as to what the histology would be. And over here, you can see that the far majority of these patients were noted to have medial fibroplasia type FMD. In fact, a large number were not reported. And actually, if you break down and just remove the patients who were not reported, more than 90% of the patients in the registry who had reported type of disorder had medial fibroplasia type. Now, let's talk about the vascular bed involvement. And initially, we looked at the previous studies, which reported that up to 60 to 70% of uh, patients had renal artery involvement and carotids were involved only in 20 to 30 percent of uh, patients. Now, the registry was a, this was another big eye opener that came out of the results from the registry. And what we found out is that renal arteries were involved in 75 percent of the patients. However, even the extracranial carotid arteries were involved in 72.7 percent of patients. So they were they, the prevalence of renal and extracranial carotid arteries was almost the same. Um, Vertebral arteries uh, were not far behind at 33.4% of patients, and mesenteric arteries were involved in 21.6% of patients. When you look at the median number of vascular beds involved, most of the patients had at least two vascular beds involved, with some patients having up to seven different vascular beds involved um, with uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. Now, when we looked at patients who had imaging of two or more vascular beds, it was interesting to see that 35.3% of patients had FMD in at least two vascular beds, 21.3% of patients had FMD in three vascular beds, and up to 9% of patients had FMD in four vascular beds. When we looked at patients who had presented with renal FMD and underwent uh, imaging of their carotid arteries or vertebral arteries, up to 64% of them had extracranial carotid artery or vertebral artery FMD. And when patients with extracranial carotid artery FMD were imaged, uh, their renal arteries were imaged, up to 64.5% of these patients had renal FMD. When we look at the prevalence of vascular events in these patients, it is, it is very concerning because almost 10% of these patients have a stroke uh, and 13.4% of these patients had, had, had a hemispheric TIA and up to 6% of these patients had amaurosis fugax. Interestingly, coronary artery disease was seen in almost 6.5% of these patients. Although renal FMD is common, renal failure or renal infarction is not that common. And there were no deaths reported from FMD. Now, this was another uh, major finding that we found from the registry. Uh, what we found out that was that 21.7% of patients with fibromuscular dysplasia in the registry had a dissection, and 22.2% of patients had aneurysms. Um, with regards to dissection, when we looked at more at the breakdown, what was seen is that carotid artery FMD was seen in 75% of patients, 
renal artery SMD was seen in 21. Renal artery dissection was seen in 21.6% of patients. When we looked at patients who had dissection in more than one vascular bed, almost 20% of patients had um, dissection in, in more than one vascular bed. And looking at aneurysms, 17.3% of patients had um, aneurysms in more than one vascular bed, uh, with some cases having aneurysms in almost four different vascular beds. We looked at further into gender breakdown. Uh, as you know, more than 90% of patients with fibromuscular dysplasia are women. Uh, but when we started looking at more as do women present different from men, what we're seeing is that women typically present more with signs and symptoms of carotid fibromuscular dysplasia. So this typically is pulsatile tinnitus, cervical buoy, or neck pain. Men frequently present more with signs and symptoms of renal fibromuscular dysplasia, such as flank or abdominal renal insufficiency or infarction. Now, what was also interesting is that although FMD is not common in men, when it presents in men, they are more likely to dissect and, or have an aneurysm. In fact, men are twice more likely to dissect or have an aneurysm as compared to women. And if men dissect, they typically dissect the renal artery, and uh, women typically dissect the carotid artery. Again, we don't know why this happens, but this is what we have seen. Um, again, aneurysms, when you look at it in men, it is more likely to occur in the aorta or the celiac artery, and in women, it typically more likely happens in the renal arteries. Let's talk about treatment. And uh, when you look at treatment for patients with FMD, you're looking at medical therapy, endovascular therapy, and surgical therapy. So let's start with renal fibromuscular dysplasia. And we'll start with percutaneous balloon angioplasty. Uh, firstly, percutaneous balloon angioplasty is, is a standard of care for patients with FMD uh, who have certain symptoms. So if you have a patient who has recent onset FMD, if it is recent on, sorry, a patient who has recent onset hypertension, so if you have a patient who has recent onset hypertension, even if it's well controlled with medications, it's certainly worthwhile to consider angiography and balloon angioplasty as you might be able to completely cure, fibromus, uh, completely cure hypertension in these patients. Certainly, it should be considered in patients who have resistant hypertension, which is defined as being hypertensive um, with a systolic blood pressure greater than 160 while being on three antihypertensive agents, including a diuretic. Again, if you have patients who are not controlled and are intolerant to multiple antihypertensive medications who have FMD, this should be considered. Certainly, patients non-compliant with medications uh, should be considered for it. And finally, if you have a patient who has renal impairment or loss of renal volume, um, then certainly you should consider angioplasty in them too. And this is a chart which looks at multiple different studies uh, looking at um, angioplasty in patients with FMD. And here you can see the technical success is excellent um, with regards to fibromuscular dysplasia with just balloon angioplasty alone without needing a stent. Um, however, when you look at hypertension, the numbers for cured hypertension initially appears to be great, but then certain numbers don't look so well, and I think this depends more on patient selection. Certainly, the number of patients with hypertension that improved with, anti with uh, angioplasty still remains to be high. Um, so lastly, again, stents is not the primary therapy for patients with renal fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, you should always consider angioplasty first and only consider stenting if you don't have great technical success or if there is an iatrogenic dissection. Other forms of therapy consist of surgery, and surgery is certainly limited only to patients with macroaneurysms. Again, a lot of these aneurysms nowadays can be repaired endovascularly too. Lastly, medical therapy. Uh, we typically put all of these patients on antiplatelet agents, uh, namely just aspirin. Um, and this is done as we suspect that these patients may be throwing small microambulis, uh, which could lead to renal failure in the future. Um, there is a questionable uh, indication for statins or angiotensin receptor blockers. However, this has not been well validated. It is suspected that they may help with uh, 
the vascular malformation seen in these patients. However, this has never been well validated in any studies. Lastly, wait and watch is uh, what we should consider for patients who have renal FMD and have no hypertension, have normal renal functions. Um, and certainly while you wait and watch, you should continue to monitor their blood pressure, renal function, such as their creatinine, um, and their kidney size with ultrasonography. Now looking at treatment of carotid artery fibromuscular dysplasia, uh, when we look at medical therapy, all patients with carotid artery fibromuscular dysplasia should be considered to be on antiplatelet agents. Um, typically, I use uh, aspirin for these patients. Uh, again, it's questionable if statins or angiotensin receptor blockers would be useful in these patients. Percutaneous angioplasty, again, can be considered in these patients, especially if they have had transient ischemic attacks or stroke. Stents, again, is only indicated if you don't get technical success with just angioplasty alone or if iatrogenic dissections occur. Again, surgery is recommended typically in patients who have macroaneurysms. Again, endovascular techniques are certainly useful nowadays um, for certain aneurysms. So how, how do I approach a patient with fibromuscular dysplasia? And certainly a patient with FMD is a very complex patient. The, they have multiple different symptoms, uh, which involves different organ systems. Uh, they have uh, FMD and aneurysms in multiple vascular beds. And I think this is, this is one particular condition which truly needs a multidisciplinary approach, having collaborations uh, with multiple physicians um, to help you take better care of these patients. I, I frequently work uh, with my colleagues over here um, in radiology, that is in cardiovascular imaging, interventional radiology, neuroradiology, uh, vascular surgery, vascular neurology, um, and, and we frequently work together to see these patients um, to provide the best possible care for them. And again, it is certainly important uh, to do is that if you come across a lot of these patients, that you develop your own team of physicians who are interested in this disorder in all different specialties, as well as those who have experience in this particular disorder, as then you will provide uh, excellent care for your patients. Finally, another thing that I frequently do in my clinic and is also pursued in other multiple specialty clinics is, is to pre-screen your patients coming with FMD. Typically, my nurse will uh, call the patient beforehand, go through certain questions, see what kind of imaging they have already had, and then look at what other testing we may need if we would need a consultation with other physicians in other departments, um, and we try to coordinate all of these things in the same day. A major question is, is FMD progressive? And uh, the reality is we still don't know the answer to that. Um, there are conflicting results um, with certain, uh, certain ex uh, experts uh, considering that FMD is not progressive, especially medial FMD, whereas there are certain other groups of experts that think that this certainly could be a progressive disease. Uh, so there was a study done way back in 1984 uh, where they looked at up to 66 patients with uh, medial fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, these patients were followed for 45 months um, and geographically and uh, 104 months clinically. And they felt that based on angiography, there was progression in almost one third of the patients. Nine percent had an increase in creatinine and 27 percent had an atrophy in its lateral kidneys. Now, again, this has not been proven again in any future studies and how the degree of stenosis worsened is not validated in these patients. Another study looked at 57 patients with hyper, hypertension and renal FMD. Um, and in this particular um, study, based on imaging, um, the physicians felt that there was progression or development of new disease in uh, almost 74% of patients. Again, um, how the progression was assessed has not been validated in these patients, and we certainly don't know if this is accurate. Another study looking at similar data uh, was uh, a renal donor study where they looked at more than 1,800 angiograms, 71 patients, which was 3.8% of the patients had renal FMD, 
um, half of these did not undergo nephrectomy, and 26% of them then developed hypertension over a period of seven years. 19% of the, 19 patients who did actually undergo nephrectomy, 26% of them developed hypertension in a follow-up of 4.4 years. And what they noticed was in patients who were in the control group and had no FMD, only 6% developed hypertension in a follow-up of seven years. So based on this data, they felt that FMD may be progressive. Again, there is there's really uh, no definitive method to prove that the hypertension occurrence in these patients happened because of FMD um, or whether hypertension had developed because they started developing essential hypertension. Um, there is data that may come out in the near future um, that may state that FMD may, is actually not progressive. So, so we really don't know what the what the reality is with this particular disease. Now, I would like to talk briefly about spontaneous coronary artery dissection and fibromuscular dysplasia, and this is something very new that we have learned. So in Vancouver General Hospital, they screened about 50 patients with non-atherosclerotic spontaneous coronary artery dissections. Um, of these, 45 patients underwent complete imaging of their renal carotids and external iliac arteries, and five, five patients had imaging of some of these vessels. And what they found out was very interesting. Well, it was that 86% of these patients had fibromuscular dysplasia in at least one location. 58% uh, had in the renal arteries, 48% had it in the iliacs, 46.5% uh, had it in the carotids or vertebral arteries, and a whooping 14% had intracranial aneurysms that was diagnosed only because the, these guys proceeded with imaging uh, these patients aggressively. Fibromuscular dysplasia is, is still a mystery, and there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Some of these are, is FMD a manifestation of a broader connective tissue disorder, or is it just a specific and limited entity? Intimal and medial FMD, are they truly the same disease, or are they different types of disorders that we are just um, bundling up in one particular type of disease? What is really the true prevalence of carotid and renal fibromuscular dysplasia in general population? We have data looking at renal donors. We have data looking at renovascular hypertension, but we truly don't have any data looking at just general population. Next question is, what is the biological explanation as to why women are more likely to be affected than men? Um, another important question that we really need to understand is what is the best way to assess severity of stenosis in FMD to best predict your procedural outcomes? And geographically, you see multiple beaded-like appearance, but sometimes the area of stenosis could be narrowed down by just a web-like appearance, and you truly don't know how narrow this could be. Um, at certain centers, we use uh, pressure gradients, to look at the degree of uh, stenosis. At other centers, I've heard about physicians using intravascular ultrasound to look at the webbing and uh, image uh, to look at the narrowing of the vessels. And lastly, what is the true risk of pregnancy associated with fibromuscular dysplasia? Uh, again, we don't know the answer to this. So when should you consider a patient to be evaluated for fibromuscular dysplasia? Firstly, if they have onset of hypertension at age of less than 35 years, we should consider them to be evaluated. Resistant hypertension, patients with epigastric brewery and high blood pressure, patients who have cervical brewery who are less than 60 years of age and especially with no cardiovascular risk factors, patients with pulsatile tinnitus, those who hear swishing or rushing sound in their ears, patients who have severe and recurrent headaches, especially migraine-type headaches, it is certainly worthwhile to consider evaluating them for FMD. Patients who are present with a TI or stroke at an age uh, younger than 60 years of age or those who don't have any significant cardiovascular risk factors. Patients who dissect their peripheral arteries, such as carotids, vertebral, or renal arteries, should be evaluated for FMD. Noting aneurysms in visceral or intracranial organs, intracranial vessels should be evaluated for FMD. 
um, aortic aneurysm seen in patients younger than 60 years of age, patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and lastly, those presenting with renal infarction. Finally, some summary points, uh, as well as clinical uh, polls for patients with FMD. Firstly, um, FMD is a non-atherosclerotic, non-inflammatory arterial disorder that commonly involves the renal arteries and the carotid arteries. Uh, the clinical spectrum for FMD is very broad. It can range from patients who are completely asymptomatic to those who dissect or have major strokes or subarachnoid hemorrhages. Um, think of carotid FMD for any middle-aged patient who presents with cervical brewery and postile tinnitus or migraine headaches. Certainly think of uh, renal FMD in the workup of early onset or um, medication refractory hypertension. All patients who have carotid fibromuscular dysplasia should certainly undergo brain imaging. Um, in fact, what I would suggest is if you have any patients with fibromuscular dysplasia, consider at least a one-time imaging uh, from the head to the pelvis, either with a CTA or an MRA. If you do find patients with uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, please try to enroll them in the fibromuscular dysplasia registry, um, as uh, this would certainly provide us more insight as we keep collecting more and more data on large number of these patients. Certainly, there are physicians now looking at uh, more genetic studies uh, for fibromuscular dysplasia. There are studies from uh, coming from the University of Michigan where, um, where physicians are looking at uh, gene-wide association studies for patients with this particular disorder. Um, the American Heart Association has now taken great interest in this uh, particular disorder, and uh, I believe uh, early next year or maybe by mid-next year, we should have a statement a scientific statement from the American Heart Association for this particular disorder. There is much to be learned about the pathogenesis, natural history, and optimal treatment for patients with fibromuscular dysplasia. But the first thing we need to do is to recognize this disorder among our patients and initiate the appropriate workup um, and certainly then proceed uh, further beyond. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really great lecture. Thanks, Monica. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, so first, what is the best way um, to enroll patients in the FMD registry? I think it's a, it's a fairly easy if you um, are, you know, are currently working in one of the centers. So let me just pull up the centers again here for you. Well, Menica, for you, it's uh, University of Virginia. It's, it's a center, and you can contact me if you ever have any patients. Just let me know. Um, um, but the other centers that are currently involved uh, are the Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, Greenville Hospital System, University of Michigan, uh, Massachusetts General Mayo. Um, there's a center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, UC Davis, Oshner, and Baptist. Um, you know, if um, if you do see a lot of uh, FMD in, in your institution, um, I think it's only worthwhile to contact the registry to see if you could be a participating center too. Um, another question that we had um, was we, we feel that a common scenario is um, seeing patients with essential hypertension that are on multiple medications and they have a negative um, renal artery duplex, in what situations would you proceed to other imaging, such as a CTA or MRA of the renal arteries? Uh, this is a very good question, uh, and I frequently come across this situation. Um, and so I typically look at the patient now. Um, so just giving you an example, if, if I see a 70-year-old man um, with uh, essential hypertension that's not well controlled, who is um, fairly skinny, um, and uh, um, and it looks like his renal arteries were well imaged. And this is one point where I, I have a discussion with the technician, the technologist who does the study, and I make sure that they image the mid and distal renal arteries well. 
um, and they can typically tell you if they were able to visualize them adequately um, and if they were confident that they were able to do this well and if they were um, and and the patient doesn't fit your typical criteria for somebody who could have FMD, then, then generally I won't proceed with any further imaging. Again, if I suspect any other secondary causes of hypertension also, then I, I don't proceed uh, with more imaging. Now, on the other hand, if I have somebody, uh, supposing I have a lady who's in her 30s or 40s um, and uh, has, um, has, has hypertension, um, you know, and uh, looks like on the renal duplex, uh, there's no elevation in velocities, but if you talk to the tech and they tell you that uh, the, you know, the vessels appeared very tortuous and they had a tough time getting the flow, or even if they tell you it was very tortuous, uh, I, I would certainly consider getting a CT or an MRA um, to look for uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, you know, it's, um, so uh, that, that's how I would proceed. Now, again, a lot of these patients, I'll, I'll make sure to look for uh, other possible causes of hypertension too before I, you know, I subject them to contrast um, and radiation. Um, another question that we had is, have you seen dissecting intracranial aneurysms in patients that have been diagnosed or are suspected to have FMD? I'm, I'm sorry, Manika, could you repeat that question? Dissecting intracranial aneurysm in patients that have been diagnosed or are suspected to have FMD. Uh, yes, very often. Uh, very often we see intracranial aneurysms um, in, uh, in patients, uh, with, especially with carotid FMD. Um, and, uh, often uh, also we'll see patients who present, uh, unfortunately a lot of times we see patients who present with carotid dissections who um, then also have FMD. Um, but um, when we look at specifically intracranial aneurysms, it is, it is not uncommon that I would find somebody with FMD and we proceed with um, head imaging, and we'll, we'll find it for cranial aneurysms. On their initial imaging of their brain, you don't see any aneurysms. Do you continue to screen them, or do you just do one-time imaging and then do subsequent imaging if they have symptoms, or how do you approach that? That's actually a, another very good question. So. Uh, so this is something, again, we, we don't know exactly what to do. Uh, for now, what most of the experts would recommend is that um, you do at least one-time imaging. Uh, and uh, in gen generally, we have done one-time imaging and we don't do follow-up imaging. However, I think uh, I can tell you anecdotally, uh, I've heard of uh, at least a couple of cases where um, physicians at other institutions have told me how they had patients who were imaged once had no aneurysms, and however, then four or five years later, the patient had presented with a subarachnoid nerve hemorrhage uh, with a ruptured aneurysm. So, so at the end of the day, we, we truly don't know if we should be repeating their head imaging, uh, but for now, we recommend at least once to image. Um, another question that we had is, have you ever seen coronary FMD? Personally, I have not seen coronary FMD, but there are certainly case reports of, of coronary FMD. Um, I have seen patients with uh, spontaneous coronary dissections that we later on diagnosed uh, with uh, carotid or renal FMD. Another question we have is um, when you see an isolated mesenteric dissection without inflammatory changes or elevated um, CRP or ESR, how do you tease out the etiology, whether it's FMD or um, SAM or another type of connective tissue disorder? Um, I think that's, a, that's a great question, too. Um, and I think this is where you, you look at the patient as a whole. Um, so one of the major things you, uh, you, know, you, you look at is um, with regards to their clinical features and how they present it to you. Make sure this is not a trauma-related trauma situation. Um, and if it's not trauma, then um, clinically, do these patients have any physical findings that would make you concerned for vascular connective tissue disorders? And, and physical findings could be hyperflexibility. Uh, you could have patients who have very thin skin. 
Um, you know, you certainly look for features of Mark Fonz syndrome, yeah, which you know typically you have their arm length span um, is uh, is very uh, is very different. Um, um, also, some other features that we look for. Um, um, also, some other features that we look for is um, um, is uh, um, other vessels. What else is going on? Do they have aneurysms in other locations? If they do, that again could indicate um, you know a connective tissue disease. Um, now, so that that's one way to differentiate uh, patients uh, with clinical findings. Um, when you are trying to isolate SAM from FMD, now that that is certainly um, a, a difficult situation. And but uh, one of the things that we see with SAM is a patient with SAM typically have some bleeding within the lumen, and um, and this is where I usually will sit down with my cardiovascular imaging colleagues and review the imaging uh, very closely with them because. Uh, you will see some amount of wall thickening with SAM, uh, and that's typically because there's some bleeding within the vessel. Also, patients with SAM uh, present more aggressively and critically. So uh, patients with FMD don't usually present with severe bleeding in their abdomen or so on, uh, but for SAM, hematochesia is a very common form of presentation. And so, so you'll find these two differences. Another thing longitudinally, a lot of times, SAM is a self-limiting disease, and if you image them over a period of months, uh, SAM shows a regression of um, of, uh, of their uh, pathology, be it aneurysms or, or stenosis, uh, whereas with fibromuscular dysplasia, you won't see that unless you proceed with uh, doing some kind of endovascular procedure on them. Um, I think that's all. Does anybody have any other questions? If not, Dr. Sharma, thank you so much for your time and a really excellent lecture. Um, we really appreciate it, and hopefully we can uh, have you back again sometime for another lecture. This is really great, and we appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks.